All right, welcome to Casey Hammer's explanation of how I did the 3D printed quasi crystal model. This is the first uh, on screen recording I've ever done, so it's going to be incredibly rough. <coughs> uh, much like the actual programming method I used, which I term something like hedge hopping programming or basically stumbling about in the dark until you get the right answer. Um, I know of at least two more efficient, more elegant ways of solving this problem, but I once chanced to play with a 3D printed model of quasi-crystals um, taken from the Sokola Levine paper in 1986. Um, it was actually Paul Steinhardt's um, models, and I wanted to replicate that feeling of, of putting the pieces together in, in my hands uh, when I was doing this model. So. Without further ado, let's talk about this. I'm going to assume that if you don't know what a quasi-crystal is, you've pressed pause and Googled it in Wikipedia. <coughs> um, so for this particular model, which is the A-type um, icosahedral vertex, um, you can model it. I mean, you can model quasi-crystals with a you know, quasi-infinite range of, of pieces. This particular one allows you to model it using four fundamental subunits, um, which repeat. Um, and the subunits are constructed of these special diamonds, um, which you know assemble in certain ways um, to form closed uh, three-dimensional solids uh, with many axes of symmetry. And these particular angles are non-trivial. Um, I actually ended up inadvertently recalculating at one point, which I'll point out. Um, and then you know if you were to cut these out and assemble them and then put them together with like triangles and triangles and arrows and arrows and so on, you'd be able to build out your quasi-crystal um, lattice. Which is which is pretty cool. So this is this key angle. It is the arc cosine of one divided by the square root of five, um, one point one oh seven one five radians. And I mean that's just like the one of the fundamental angles of icosahedral symmetry. So um, I mean when you phrase it like that, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the first step is to define a unit line. This is pretty straightforward. It's just a line that goes from the origin to one zero zero. Um, I'm using Mathematica here because it tends to um, Minimize programming time at the cost necessarily of, of uh, time at execution, um, but it also allows you to kind of dive in and dive out of the of the the finicky details. Um, <coughs> like you know, you'll see some examples of the cool stuff it can do. So this is it doing symbolic algebra. This is a rotation matrices uh, to rotate around the axes x, y, and z. Z. I am Australian, as you may have guessed. Um, this is the line. Uh, the line. Uh, acute angle, so basically you take um, the original line here and then you rotate the line with this rotation matrix and then you've got, you can basically form a unit rhombus um, and then in order to assume, to produce the, the, the first, the smallest of the of the four shapes, you need to produce a third line uh, which corresponds to this this line here and uh, I just use the solve functionality Mathematica to find a uh, position um, here, which is you know exactly one unit from the origin and has the appropriate angles from, from these two lines, uh, and this is two different solutions, but I picked the, the positive one, um, and then that's how I constructed the first shape. So shape one is is this thing here, uh, and you can you know, rotate this and so on because Mathematica is useful in many ways. Um, and then that's how you make the second shape. Um, it looks like my computer may have reset itself at some point, so possibly some of these things I won't be able to do in real time, they take a couple of minutes to calculate, but in any case, um, here's the angle, basically put together a bunch of the different rhombuses, and um, as an example, um, I could use uh, graphics 3D to, to display what these rhombuses positions were in at any one time, um, so these are all running more or less instantaneously, and then this is the shape of, of shape 2. So it's it's a pretty neat one. It's uh, it's kind of got these two pointy ends, and then a a kind of diamond shaped equator. Um, it's going to be useful for filling some stuff in. And here's the third shape. So the third shape has this um, kind of pentagonal set at the bottom. And the way I defined this was um, I took five, five lines, and then I I just kind of raised the middle point until the angles became appropriate. And that's the way I kind of used symmetry to figure out um, what what the height of the middle point was. And I think it's 0.5 or something equally banal. Um, and then fed that into into these things to basically construct the, the appropriate rhombus shape, and then essentially bootstrap my way to um, what this third shape looks like. 
obviously there's, there's a horizontal axis symmetry there, so I was able to do half the shape and then just mirror image it uh, with a with a you know, I guess two pi on ten rotation um, to get the complete shape. And then there's only one possible fourth shape that you can make out of these rhombuses and diamonds, uh, which is this one here. Um, and as you can see, it is super pretty with lots and lots of gorgeous symmetry in every every direction. Um, <coughs> anyway, so now I was kind of worrying like how do I assemble these together and it wasn't entirely clear what the, the best way of taking these, these four different shapes and, and stacking them all together would be. Um, and so the first thing I did was look at this picture and like try and work out how to make, identify these triangles with certain points and then stick them together. Um, and then here's a printout of the four different shapes using a, a color um, kind of tradition that will become obvious coming up soon. Uh, and I very quickly realized that what I needed to do was write some functions that performed um, Poincaré transformations. So that's basically rotations and translations um, on these shapes. So any of these shapes um, are helpfully defined with, with all the different rhombuses still intact. They're not reduced to just individual lines. Um, so it turns out there's some redundancy in, in their definitions. And, you know, like this line here is specified twice, one for each rhombus in which it is uh, adjoined. Um, that means that I can specify like these four shapes rather easily with just a single kind of uh, call into a, a big array of, of numbers. Um, and then having done that, I can specify, say, this rhombus over here and then be like, um, make this one go over here and sit on this one. And it turns out that um, even if you can do that perfectly, there's still like uh, some additional symmetries. Like you can you can be rotated on this or flipped on this. So you need to be able to, to call through stuff. But basically I want to write a function that did all that hard, what I call advection work, uh, rotation and advection work. And then I could just kind of very quickly stumble my way through the possibilities if it didn't work out properly. Um, and as it turned out, this function, I never properly debugged it, but it worked just well enough to get the project done. So uh, as I said, this is, you know, by all, by any means possible programming, it's um, it's a new pro programming paradigm. Um, Mathematica is, is uh, it's not a self-documenting language, it's a self-encrypting language. So I have these functions here that find the major axis and the minor axis of any given um, rhombus, which is pretty straightforward calculation. And then, um, <coughs> as a translate to origin function, uh, which basically determines the distance of that rhombus from the origin. Um, and then there's a principal direction function, which um, does something that is useful later on, I guess. Um, uh, I can't remember exactly how, how that fits together. And this principal angles function uh, determines the angles of the two different shapes. Um, so, you know, you, you rotate along, say, the long axis until it's level with, with say, the x-axis or the xy plane, and then rotate around the short axis until it's, it's uh, level with, uh, until it's, you know, completely aligned with the xy plane. And once you've done that with, with both shapes, you, you know what their angles are, and you can basically subtract all the angles from shape two, translate it to shape one, and then add all the angles of shape one back in, and crossing fingers, you know, 60% of the time works all the time. Um, you can put all the shapes together. So this is the parallel transport function. I'm not sure what parallel transport is kind of the technical term for what I'm doing, but I guess if you defined a sufficiently curved space time, it would make sense. Um, and then here is basically stacking all four shapes together um, face to face, and it's just an arbitrary kind of shape. So I thought I can parallel transport vectors, prune and 3Dify it, but I, I thought, you know, I'll just kind of jump in and see how I go, and in the end, um, the whole thing worked out rather well. Um, so this is the construction that I decided to use. It's the A-type vertex uh, from figure seven of Madison 2014. Um, and it starts with, with 20 copies of the, um, the smallest of the four fundamental shapes, the orange one, um, stacked together uh, all, all with their points kind of inwards. Uh, and then you add a whole bunch of things. And at the very end, the last step from, from I to J is to add in 20 more of those little rhombuses um, with their points all in the same location, but exploded outwards, separated by these intervening eight or nine layers. Um, you know, so you basically, you construct this, then you shove a bunch of these guys on, a bunch of these guys on and so on. And I, I realized this would be quite an exhausting process to do by hand, especially given that the parallel transport function didn't work properly, um, except uh, that um, basically you all know between a icosahedral and dodecahedral symmetry. So you can, um, once, once you found out like how to put one of these guys on, then you can uh, just rotate that by two pi on five uh, radians and and get like the next five and then you find one special case, do the next one and then you just do a mirror image. Um, and that basically encapsulates all the possibilities. And I did this like six different ways because 
I did this over like four subsequent weekends at the middle of the night, wasn't thinking very clearly. Of course, in hindsight, uh, I know exactly how to do this much more efficiently, but whatever. Um, so then you fill in the holes with these with the orange guys, and then you, you fill in the concavities with the blue guys, uh, and then you fill in some more concavities with um, these green fellas, and then uh, you add a whole bunch more of the red guys in to fill this these holes here, um, and then, um, <coughs> or rather, that, that hole doesn't, doesn't get filled, but you fill these holes in, inside the green, the green things um, and, and in the intervening spaces. Um, and so I actually conflated steps G and H, as we will see, because there's more, some reds and then more reds and then purples and then the very last reds in the little interstitial gaps. So exploit icosahedral symmetry. So piece one, piece two, piece three, piece four, and so on are, are kind of demarcating each of these steps one through the next. So if I run this uh, and then uh, moment of truth, um, graphics 3D line piece one. Oh, that's not good. Um, okay, now you can see me debugging stuff in real time, piece one. Uh, okay, so the problem is line is used to taking a vector of lines and I've put in a matrix of lines, so I will just flatten the first dimension and there is piece one. So that's that's pretty nice and I can add some additional arguments to make this thick orange. Um, that's super pretty. Uh, and you can probably tell that like, by the time I finished this project I had a lot of lines and it was very difficult to see what was fitting onto what. Um, so there's probably a more efficient way of doing this. Um, it would be really cool if, for instance, you could convert them to solid shapes like this, but that would require too much effort. So I just kind of made do. And then I'm going to borrow this guy and use it for subsequent pieces. So piece two is here. Um, let's just switch back to black here. And I'll throw in piece two here. So that, that kind of surrounds that, that inner feature. Um, and and so on we go. Um, piece three, piece four. Um, piece four looks like it might be interesting, so let's have a look at what we've got here. Piece four. Mm, what is going on here? Um, so let's have a look at the fundamental unit. All right, so we needed to fit a whole bunch of these guys together to make this kind of plug and then um, uh, stacked more pieces on top of that. Um, again, lots of rotational symmetry, and piece three is stacking the final set of pieces in between those gaps. I don't know if you saw the difference there, but this is piece two. You got like these V-shaped gaps uh, into which you need to stack more pieces. So that's piece three, um, and then uh, piece four is just a Jaya, uh, I guess, uh, 12 copies of, of this guy, um, all stacked around the circle, uh, stacked around the sphere. Uh, and then, obviously, if you add in the other pieces, they all kind of uh, fit in together there, but it would just be even more of a dog's breakfast and hard to see. Um, all right, piece five, let's have a look at what this guy looks like. Um, piece five, one. All right, so having done that, that nice little star-shaped plug thing we now fit together um, five of the third shape and then that stacks on top um, and then obviously we do the, the routine uh, kind of thing here to, to fill them all out uh, and at some point here I, I was trying to calculate like what the the crucial angle was from like the say a polar oriented like an x-oriented piece here to the next piece around and I was like eh, it should be something like two pi and five degrees it's not it turns out it's the arc sine of 1 divided by the square root of 5, uh, which is the same as that, that fundamental angle that we calculated in the very first line. It didn't occur to me the day, so I ended up just solving it by hand, like solving it using the solve function, and didn't really realize that I'd, I'd screwed up in such a hilariously inefficient way. But at the end of the day, still got it done. Um, P6, um, as you can see, struggled a little bit, um, but you know, it's just a consequence of, of basically having to fit together gigantic numbers of pieces. Um, so P61 um, is this, so you know I had to kind of uh, take take three of these pieces and fit them all together um, in in a non silly way. Uh, and then and then figure out how to fit these onto each other for the the whole the whole thing. So um, it it did require a lot of trial and error this particular level. Um, but 
just to kind of make sure it was all right. Uh, it's often not particularly clear in this diagram uh, exactly what is going on as well. You get these very, very tiny lines, and you know, well, what does that mean? Um, it's, the shape is a lot more concave in the holes than it seems in those pictures. Um, so that's, that's piece six. We're getting close to the outside, but at this point I kind of had a system. Uh, and so in piece seven, for instance, I'm, there's lots of these parallel transport functions just kind of um, ran through identifying which were the key, uh, the key uh, rhombuses that needed to have pieces added to them from the previous shape. Um, and then just basically iterating all the way through. And in one example here, for instance, I ac accidentally um, uh, kind of produced the same piece twice by, by propagating it off two adjacent faces, which caused problems. So I just threw in delete duplicates here and left it at that. Um, all right, so let's look at one. Piece eight, uh, piece seven rather is, yeah, that's kind of a nightmare. Um, but, you know, what can you do? Um, and piece 8 was pretty straightforward, and piece 9 was also pretty straightforward. Piece 9 was just these big soccer ball type pieces, so that was quite nice. Um, oh, sorry, piece 8, rather, is the big soccer ball type pieces. And in this case, I just basically had to find out, like, how to fit um, three of those onto the previous piece, um, like this. Uh, so if we throw in piece seven, one here as well. Mm. Blue. Oh, lovely. Oh, it might be purple, actually. And then... Um, green, piece seven, one. All right, so we can kind of see what's going on here. We've got that piece under there and then we've just figured out how to how to drop the the purple guys on top of that which is just a matter of a, identifying the, the face that you want um, and, in, and because the parallel transport function is a bit finicky basically translate trying every possible combination until until it worked out which turns out it's easier than debugging something that is dealing with um, angular singularities near the pole there are of course formal ways of dealing with that but not ones that I found easily accessible at you know, one o'clock in the morning. I was just trying to figure out what to do. Um, and then uh, piece nine is just the, this little tiny um, blue diamond that, that fits in, the, in the, the crevice left between these three surrounding pieces. And then of course we throw the whole lot together because you know, have to do a victory lap. So this is what the whole thing looks when combined. It's also not very clear from this, but these, these shapes here are big craters. I didn't really realize that until I, I ordered the 3D print. It should arrive in a couple of days, so um, that'll be fun. Um, anyway, so what goes on here is um, essentially there's, there's 26,760, uh, 29,760 lines in this, in this structure, uh, many of which um, are at least triply redundant. Um, and so I wanted to remove them. And unfortunately, just doing the delete duplicates uh, doesn't work perfectly because these are um, floating point numbers, um, how they're defined in Mathematica. So um, the, the duplicate test, uh, if you want to make it general enough to catch something, say this example here, where I've just like measured the, the mean distance from the center of each line and, and specified to be less than 0.1. Um, I didn't take the square root to save some, save some time. Um, it takes forever. So actually what I ended up doing was defining two remove dupe functions. The first one just did the first pass using the default uh, delete duplicates um, test. Uh, and the second one, um, we used a mean here in case the lines were inverted. Uh, and the second one, you run over the first one uh, in this example here. Uh, and so it doesn't, this is slower, but this one has already taken out, say, 90% of the problems. Um, and then you basically run the whole thing through. Um, and I first of all ran it on each successive stage and then I combined it to run in each sequential stage so basically like standard tree type algorithm um, to work on my way work my way through the whole thing uh, and then once I did it Mathematica has this wonderful way of storing uh, data as an image so I can just I don't have to do it all over again that would probably take about 20 minutes to process through which is a great example of Mathematica taking way too long to do something that you could essentially do in real time on a GPU um, but who cares 
uh, if I was doing these hundreds of different ones every day, then it might be worthwhile optimizing it. Um, so it turns out Mathematica has all, all kinds of fancy um, 3D printing primitives, and actually in the latest version 11, which I only came out yesterday, about three quarters of the stuff that happens in this notebook is automated away, uh, psi. But um, I define my own cylinder function because their cylinder function doesn't really translate into STL reliably. It tends to lose its end caps. And I also defined a sphere function I didn't end up using it. Um, and so you know, here, are our, here are our nodes. This might take a while. Um, <coughs> hmm. Oh, I see what's going on here. This will take a while. Um, this is this is taking basically all the lines and isolating all the endpoints and then deleting duplicates um, to identify all the all the nodes, uh, all the all the intersections between points. There's two thousand nine hundred and thirty-seven of them, so that does take a fair bit of time to compute. And then here's just a test case. So I just took you know the first fifty elements of nodes and lines and and printed the cylinders. I set the cylinder radius to be one millimeter because that's the minimum diameter you can print in plastic on shapeways. Um, and then uh, just scale up the, the general size thing to basically make sure you've got some decent sized holes in between the different features. And so this is actually half of that central shape. And then um, to find the whole model in terms of new cylinder, and now yeah, actually this is a sphere version as well that didn't work properly. but. Um, then of course I go and close my browser because Chrome leaks memory and otherwise my computer will crash. And then I export the model um, as a, uh, here's my, my file system, quasicrystal.stl file. It was about 25, 26 megabytes, which is just under half of the maximum maximum size allowed. So I could probably you know, increase the resolution of my cylinders. Quite frankly, they're good enough. And then here I just imported the, the same file so I could see it rendered as a as a you know, three-dimensional shape. So if I roll this slowly enough, you might be able to appreciate kind of the soccer ball-like nature of it. Um, the dodecahedral, I suppose. Um, and this, this model is about eight centimeters, about three inches or so wide. And I ordered a copy of Shapeways for about um, 50 bucks. So that's pretty much how I did this one. I've never done anything quite like this before. Um, but I've always been very interested, especially more recently in 3D printing, in how um, to manage the interaction of like positive and negative space. And um, I mean, 90% of what people do in 3D printing is just like cubes and spheres and triangles and I guess cylinders and lines and so on. But those are kind of the, the fundamental elements you have to work with. Um, I've done some more fancy curves and so on, but at the end of the day, you know, there's something powerful about taking. The, the most fundamental units and doing something quite unusual and quite surprising with it. Uh, and quasi crystals are pretty damn cool. They have been found in nature in meteorites, so look that up. Anyway, that's probably it, and um, thanks for playing.